Good evening, grave robbers, and welcome back to the television graveyard. We are your TV necromancers, Lara Prince and Noah Houlihan, and we have come here tonight to examine the spirits of past-ish television shows to find out which ones could be resurrected, should be resurrected, and which ones should just stay doomed. This is a podcast in which we will analyze the history, the hype, and the aftermath of shows that ran only one season, including some that ran only one episode. With me, as always, is TV's Noah Houlihan. She's twerk dying. So for this week, um, we would like to apologize. Yes, we have some business we must uh, attend to here before we get started, because this is a very special episode. Due to popular demand, we decided that we were going to extend YouTube Red, YouTube Original Month, kind of. And it was a fifth. It was a fifth week. So we we decided that we were going to look at season one of Escape the Night. Now, Escape the Night ran more than one season. So this will be the first time that we covered something that ran more than one season. But there was a lot of demand for our opinions on it because of what we said about things like Who Done It and The Quest. Unfortunately, <laughs> the moment we made that decision, season five of Escape the Night was canceled. Yes, it was canceled because of COVID, because they couldn't film season two. Uh, but Season five. Season five. I, I'm not used to things having more than one season. I know, it's very confusing. Um, and if you happen to be on the Discord for the new escape the night situation and you happen to find a user known as stay doomed perhaps you found us yeah say hi (laughs) yeah that being said very much like escape the night uh we exchanged a life for For a a life life because we also got the news that stay doomed favorite show Clone Clone High High will be returning. We are so excited that Clone High is coming back. It is still my favorite show. Not even one of my favorite shows that we've covered. Just one of my favorite shows. Yes. (laughs) So it's. I'm sorry to all the fans of Escape the Night that we sacrificed season five to the gods so that we could have Clone High. Yeah, and I... um... There's currently a Discord for whatever Escape the Night is going to become. Right. Um, so I signed up for it. I'm currently in this Discord. I have no idea what it is. I've never used Discord before. I'm not good at Discord. Because I'm very old. I have Discord. I'm a part of a few communities, but I'm not very good at it. <laughs> so this is going to be fun. I'm going to get more involved into it, but clearly my... Um, My username is Stay Doomed. Yes. TV's Noah will be jumping in there as well, I'm sure. And we're super excited for it because uh, we like weird stuff. Yeah. (laughs) So we're going to be talking about season one of Escape the Night. And just before we get into it, I I do want to preface it with this. At time of recording. We have seen up to the first episode of season three of Escape the Night. Which is a lot of fun. Now, we are going to focus on season one of Escape the Night. But towards the end, we are going to mention some stuff about season two. So we're going to do our best not to spoil anything in season two or episode one of season three. Uh, Just... Out of fairness to our listeners who may have only watched season one so that they could take part in this uh, conversation with us. Yes. But I I just wanted to say at the end, we'll throw out some stuff about season two and our thoughts there. We're not going to go episode by episode or anything like that, but we'll save that for later on. Yeah, this is a lot. This this show has been a lot of fun. It has been. So let's start by pouring one out. Yes. And this time we're not we're not pouring one out for the show. 
We're pouring one out. For all of the dead YouTubers. All those dead YouTubers. So many dead YouTubers. Just a pile of dead YouTubers. What are you drinking this week, Laura? Uh, I'm drinking a Madison. Oh. It is a takeoff of a Shark Attack cocktail. It is pineapple rum, mango lime sparkling water, blue curacao to make it look like the pool, and a... Uh, a little bit of fruit punch mio to get that blood in the water look. Very nice, very nice. I have uh, the doll room poison. This is meant to look like the poison in the doll room episode. Uh, this is created with some uh, passion fruit sparkling water for all the crimes of passion that take place in the walls of this home. And then it is a shot of your least favorite alcohol. Because it's poison. <laughs> so I have tequila in here. And also I added some of that Mio to give it some of that bloody look as well. And I tried to match the red from the actual episode. And I also put it into a very small glass. So it is mostly alcohol. And let's listen to this. <laughs> oh, and it's terrible. Ooh, ooh, I've made a terrible mistake. I just want to point out I didn't do this. Ah, uh, so now uh, I believe we have to get through this episode so that I may unlock the antidote. The antidote, the little short story about it. No, the, the antidote to... The antidote? The, the antidote to the poison I just drank. I am going to try to finish this drink throughout this episode. So if you hear... One, if you hear me wheezing, it's because uh, I'm drinking tequila and it doesn't agree with me. And two, if you hear a thunderstorm, it's because we angered the gods by doing a episode on a show that was not canceled. So, let's talk about Escape the Night. Yes, yeah, so th we're doing the first season, which starts with Joey Graceffa yes. inheriting a house. Yes. I started having dreams. about a house, a house that was built without hands. And then one day I received a letter and it became mine. Life had been breathed into a fantasy. But now it won't let me sleep. Until I invite others. A house that has been passed down for generations. It's had many owners and they've all met various weird fates. Yes. And he invites uh, a number of his friends to join him. Yes. He, invite, he invites 11 of his friends. Yes. So there are 12 contestants. Uh Shannon didn't do 13 and really leaned into the unluckiness, but I guess I guess that's not possible. Uh, and basically each one of these uh, characters or each one of these YouTubers must take upon an identity from the 1920s. Yes. And they must not bring anything, or not must not, cannot bring anything modern into the house. Yes, and no cell phones, no phones, no lights, no motor cars. Yes. So, basically, each one of these YouTubers puts on this persona. Now, at time of watching, we only knew one of the YouTubers. We later learned a few as we were, like, watching other things. But the one we knew most was uh, Shane Dawson, who was... The Renegade. The Renegade. We're, we also had Tim, who we found in uh, Prank Academy. Yes, uh, and he was... He was the uh, the mobster. The mobster, right. He was the only one that was like a criminal, so he yeah, was he, always suspicious. And he had a lot of fun with it. Yes. We had I Justine, who we also found from Prank Academy. And she was the gambler. The gambler. Which is a weird occupation. Don't, don't become a gambler. That's not a good life choice. Yeah, they, they're mostly kind of strange ones based on essentially no knowledge of the 1920s. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> basically. Um, there's also the journalist, who is Eva. 
the jazz singer, who is Glozell, the big game hunter, which is Ollie, the fixer, who is Andrea, the professor, who is Matt, the heiress, who is Sierra, uh, and the hustler, who is Lele. So most of these are not really 1920 specific. Like, I would have thought there would be a bootlegger. A bootlegger would have been good, but then you're you're talking about booze, which would kind of be a problem for ratings reasons. That being said, it goes off the rails later on in what they get away with, but... Yeah, I don't think ratings are... I, I think discussing alcohol wouldn't be a huge... Yeah, I think they actually drink in season two, now that I think about it. They do. Yeah, they just drink, so never um, mind. Yeah, I think, like, the bootlegger, maybe, like, somebody who's on Wall Street. Uh, they don't do, like, a flapper. They, they don't, don't do, do like, a flapper. They don't I have, like, of. a modern. Yeah. The people who pass for the moderns are the fixer, the heiress, and they have these, you know, they have these costumes that are very much romanticized versions of 1920s costumes. Right. Uh, they used, like, modern fabric to try to make them a little more comfortable. Yes. So they kind of did a very stylized look. Yeah, it kind of reminded me of the Great Gatsby movie that they made. The Baz Luhrmann one. Yes, where the music was, I, th- I think, it, I feel like it was the Black Eyed Peas, but it was all, like, their version of 1920s music, so it felt off and evil. Yes. <laughs> So there's just, like, it's one of those, like, very subtle things that, if you know anything about 1920s history, it's off, it's it's almost like Uncanny Valley, where it's like, ah, there's something off about it, but I don't, can't quite put my finger on it. Very cool. Very well stylized. Yes. So shout outs to the costume department. And we haven't even gotten into the cool stuff. Yeah, I will say, um... This is definitely the highest budget show we watched for Mm -hmm. YouTube. And uh, this is not a spoiler for any season. Season two clearly has more money. Yes. And from just watching the first episode of season three, they have somehow more money. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Like this looks like one of the higher budget shows we've seen. And it clearly is a good proof of concept because they clearly up the ante in the other seasons. So we have all these house guests kind of enter into this house and they kind of think it's fun. And the weird thing about this is no one is really their character. It's not like I am the renegade. It's always I'm playing the renegade. Yes. So they're told to stay in one room. Yeah, they all are like... Going to the parlor. Yes. But Shane... And Eva. And Eva, they venture elsewhere. Yeah, they kind of sneak off to, like, investigate. She's the journalist and he's the renegade, so it does feel in character. Yes. So, they see the maid, Sarah. Yes. uh, Who's definitely not suspicious at all. No, the Um, most suspicious maid ever. um, She always looks like... A dog that had turned over the garbage. Like, she's always just, like, looking down, like, mm, oh. Um, I know it's 20s, but I got a very Rocky Horror vibe off the Me staff. too. That very, like, riffraff and magenta. I was going to say that. Um, except we don't see the staff in Escape the Night doing it. No. <laughs> like they... we do in Rocky Horror. Um, so... They kind of just, like, see Sarah dragging a body around. I think the dinner is ready. Where's where's the bathroom? You should probably head downstairs. Okay, your turn. Good job. Good job. And they were like, oh, oh, poopy. And then they go back to the other room and they're like, we didn't see anything. Yeah, they they don't, they decide not to share this information with anybody. To the point where I felt like maybe... At this point, they were going to do, like, a sleep no more type thing where, like, they could explore the house and you could see different things depending on where you were in the house. Mm, like, the house being a living or... Like, sleep no more, if you're not familiar with it, is a retelling of Macbeth. Yes. Um, And you kind of are... It's a self-guided tour 
through the house. Mm-hmm. And you just kind of, the play happens wherever you happen to be. Yeah, if you don't, if you choose not to look at it, that's kind of on you. And you could end up on one-on-one scenes. You could yeah. end up seeing things no one else sees. Yeah, Sleep No More is an, an interesting comparison to this. And when uh, Shane and Eva see this, my assumption is that they're going in that direction. Of like... Anytime somebody scatters off from the group, they might see something. Right. I thought it was going to be like whodunity in that way. Mm-hmm. Of uh, you could separate, you could find stuff, you could withhold information from others. Remember that because it never comes into play. <laughs> um, because that's not a mechanic of this game. Right. You can't really hide information from people. Uh, but we don't know how the game works at yeah. this point. And neither do they. They really like, don't. Like, this is very important. And I guess this is as good a time as any to kind of bring up, like, this element of the gameplay. When we did Who Done It? Yeah. In our research, we found that every member of the cast was approached to be the killer. So they knew full well going in that this was going to be a murder mystery show. And one of the people playing is the killer, and they're going to have to try to figure it out. Right. With this, they kind of know that it's a house and it's going to get spooky. Yeah. But the mechanics of the gameplay are completely, like, not just, like, hidden, but, like, you can't really even figure them out. Yeah, like, they know it's going to be a reality show and the eliminations... In one of the behind... I believe it's the behind the season... Uh, behind the scenes for season two. They actually refer to it as a character's elimination challenge. hmm So they they know that the elimination is going to involve a staged death. Yes. Which, this is far from the first show to do that. Right. So they're prepared for that, but they don't really know what happens. So, to the surprise of everyone, there's suddenly a, a telegram... For one Shane Dawson. Yes. Shane reads the telegram, and it's the all-important information that he has been poisoned, and he immediately spits up blood. (laughs) Blood starts splurting out of Shane's mouth. I mean, what is this place? Like, I I don't like it. What the hell is going on? I think I got poisoned. Oh, Jesus! He said he was poisoned. Yeah, it feels very, like... Almost placebo, like, hey, by the way. <laughs> oh, that's why I've been feeling dizzy. <laughs> uh, so, also, you have 15 minutes to find the antidote, which, that's timing. Like, clearly they had to time that telegram. I hope yeah, they tipped him. They figured that out very well. So the the butler yes. kind of informs them, was like, there's three pieces to this antidote. You break up into teams and find it. Yeah. And that's kind of all the information they get. Yeah. This first challenge, things really fall apart for this show. Yeah. Joey, Eva, and Glozelle are one team, and they are the team that actually does something. There's supposed to be three bottles of antidote that combined Mm -hmm. will make the antidote to save Shane. Yes. Joey, Eva, and Glozelle find theirs. (laughs) The end. But And I want to say this. They find theirs because it's something like, oh, it's at the foot of the house. Hey, look at that painting. Oh, here it is. Like, their puzzle seems very easy. Yeah, and uh, Eva in this season and Liza next season are very similar to one another in that they are just, like, touching stuff, breaking stuff. Yes. Like, the other team. They're not shy about it. The other teams, I can't even tell you what they need to solve. All I know is it's very complicated, and they're not getting it. Right. And it's one of those things where they solve part of the puzzle, they open something, and then there's more. Yeah. Like, Joe was just like, I found it. Thing said it was here and it's here. Yeah. They're trying to unlock boxes, and there's like some sort of blind maze that they have to do. Yeah, Joey's role in the show is confusing at this point as well. Yes. I say at this point, and by this point I mean season one. Yes. And most of season two. Well, let me me finish (laughs) what I'm saying about this puzzle. Right. Because we're we're, as audience members, are supposed to be worried about Shane. Because his life is on the line. Yes. The people playing the game do not care about Shane. No. 
Come on, guys. Shane is like oh, dying. Shane. Oh, crap. Shane's like coughing up blood. I'm really concerned about him. I look over and everyone's just eating their food still, not really bothered about what's happening. But this guy is dying. Because this suffers from this problem where everyone's trying to be the YouTube star. Everyone's trying to be the breakout star. Yes. So there's a lot of talking over each other, like I talked about in the MatPat episode. Yeah. Where I'm like, what is what are they even saying? The uh, puzzles are so arbitrary and they're not figuring it out. And I have no idea what's going on. So I'm lost in what they're doing. Yeah, it's not one of those reality shows where the audience is tipped off as to what they yeah, need to be doing. Because uh, recently... You and I watched uh, Jack Black's Celebrity Escape Room. Yeah, that was fun. And it was a lot of fun. But a major part of it was they would enter a room and Jack Black would say, Welcome to the 80s. I put a lot of interesting things into this room for my celebrity friends to discover. But if they want to escape, they'll need to realize there's something missing on this bulletin board and something very unusual about this table. Solve these two puzzles and they'll raise $30,000 and they'll enter a new room. So at least we go in going, okay, we know what needs to be accomplished and they don't. And we can watch them kind of discover it. And it provides that like horror movie-esque, like, oh my God, Adam Scott, go in the locker. Like, yes. Instead of this, we're like, I don't know what I should be yelling at them to do. They're not doing, they're not doing it right, but I don't know what they're doing wrong. Yeah, they fail, and they fail in such a way that I, as an audience member, don't know if they're stupid or if the puzzle was impossible. This is true. Because, like, not only do they fail, but it's never like, like, the maid doesn't come in and go, oh, the combination's seven, eight, nine. If you looked in the mirror, you could... Like, we get no explanation of what was supposed to happen. No. And Shane is dead. Yeah, and we we discussed this at length, whether we thought it was even possible to save Shane. What do you think? Um, I'm kind of, Shane was, at this time, the biggest name. Yeah. Uh, in that Shane was the YouTuber I had heard of. Before YouTube Premium Month. Granted, I've heard of him for reasons that are not great. Not the best of reasons, yeah. Um, and have only gotten worse since... We mentioned his name and there was thunder. Yeah, apparently, you know. Uh, but he's he's only... The reasons we know who he is have only gotten worse since we started watching Escape the Night. Yes. Uh, as it's gotten more and more in the news. Um, however, he... Um, I don't know. Since he's the biggest name, I didn't know if he was the uh, Law and Order esque star who shows up to be killed. Yes, uh, it's. It definitely seemed like odd that he was poisoned. Like you kind of put together that oh, he was poisoned because uh, he went up to, and saw the maid do whatever the maid was doing. So you could kind of argue, I guess someone else could have done that. But we have no way of seeing that. But I am happy to say that Noah did some research. Noah did, Noah did, Noah did some research. Noah did some hardcore research. So We're actually, we're recording this a little later than our usual spot. So uh, uh, shout out to Grave Robert M. He's the one who uh, gave us the gift card to YouTube Red. And uh, we have been talking a little bit about this show. He really wanted us to do Escape the Night. And he mentioned something that he found out about the show. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. How did you find that out? He was like, oh, I just messaged Adam Lawson, who co-wrote the show. Yes. The director of the show. And I was like, oh. Well, I'm Can gonna, we do that? I'm going to message him. So I've been talking with Adam Lawson quite a bit. Uh, yeah. And one of the things I asked him was, uh, could Shane have been saved? And the answer is yes. Okay. It was guaranteed that Shane was going to be the one who uh, was poisoned. Yes. That was already set up and, like, was going to happen. Had they solved all the challenges in time, they would have saved Shane. 
It was purposely very hard, but it was possible. Okay. Had he survived when the carriage exploded, the, the their way out, he would have been murdered by the gardener. Okay, so Shane was always going to die in the first so, episode. So Shane was dead. She, there was no chance in the world that Shane was going to win the show, but they could have saved him. And then been, <laughs> there would have been a moment where the carriage exploded. They'd be like, oh no, we're trapped. And the gardener was snuck in and shanked him and ran away. <laughs> Because uh, that actually answers a question about a later episode that we'll discuss about whether something happened because they failed to save Shane. Uh, so it's what he sent to me in the message was uh, uh, Shane uh, would have been the gardener killed him outside when the explosion happened. And under the hysterics, he could ru- he could do the kill and run away. Uh, he was the one who set the dynamite. Okay. That blew up the carriage. Uh, would have added a cool subplot of the evil gardener. That was the alternate death for Shane if the group saved him. Marvin the gardener would have killed him. Yeah, and no one does the pansies like Marvin. Exactly. Which is a real line in the show. <laughs> so they don't save Shane. Yes. Um, so that's very important. And they have to gather these artifacts. Yes. Uh, this seems to be... We've only seen two seasons so far, but... Uh, each episode is a fetch quest. Yes. An elaborate death-oriented fetch quest. hmm And so they have to gather the artifacts to satisfy the house before they can escape and get back to their time. Yes. And also the carriage goes boom. Yes. And, like, I, I again want to point this out. The reaction to the carriage going boom, they really lay on, like, we have to get back to 2016. I want my iPhone. It's like, uh, like they're again portraying their characters instead of being those characters. And sidebar, knowing what you know about 2016, do you really want to go back to 2016? It's like coming back to 2020. I, I mean, I think I'd rather go to 2016 than 2020. But could you imagine like Escape the Night season five would have been them being like, no, we're staying. <laughs> You know. the, the next season of Escape the Night takes place in 2020. And they're like, there will not be a next year <laughs> if we don't escape. Adam Lawson, we'll help you work on this. <laughs> yeah, we have tons of ideas. Hire us. Um, <laughs> shoot your shot. Yes. So uh, the next episode is The Ungodly Machine. This is the first one where we see the pre-episode cinematic. Yes. I say cinematic because it does feel like a cut scene. Yeah. Um, it, it, it feels very video gamey. Like, before the level, here's a little video to get you in mind of what's going on. And it's this terrifying... Uh, it's this terrifying machine that kills these two test subjects. Yes. Uh, and then brings to life this terrifying monster. No, am I wrong? Or do we not see this monster ever again? You know, I just had, I literally just had that thought. Because the monster's super cool. Like, he has, like, that Wolverine Origins entrance where he, like, pops out of a water casket and is like, hi sha sha But then I was like, did they fight them? I don't remember this ever coming up again. No, I guess we just, like, guess we just have that monster hanging right. around. I wonder if that monster was, like, a... In case of problem, break glass, and the monster could just kill somebody. Yeah, it is quite possible that there was some subplot that they just didn't get to. Yeah. So they do... um, So we get the setup of what the ungodly machine is. Yes. And then uh, they they find out they have to get their clue through the spirit board when we get back to the 1920s and the group that's in the house. Mm -hmm. So we have to get the spirit board, which is a special effect. Yes. So to me, that's just a producer screaming from off camera. I I think that the, the spirit board is gimmicked. Yeah. But And I like this as a mechanic because in a later episode, they get stuck. And they're like, let's go ask the spirit board. And the spirit board gives them a hint. And I was like, this is a really cool escape the room mechanic. Yeah, it's the guy in the escape the room who goes over the loudspeaker and yells at you. Yeah, it's just like, yeah, maybe they'll open all the drawers. <laughs> Not that I would know what that's like, because I've never had to get a hint in an escape room. 
We're really good at escape the rooms, guys. Really, I really am. Like, it's a lot of fun. So they have, it spells out books. So they need to find all these books to get the code. And then they have to play a chessboard in a specific arrangement. These are really good escape the room puzzles. Yes. And we do find out in the special uh, features, that was the, the behind the scenes episode, that they did in fact hire these escape the room experts. Yes. To build everything. Yes. And it is brilliantly built. Uh, as I will, but I have some other issues with it that I'll bring up later. So they unlock the cabinet and they get this note that they have to go to the basement and uh, unleash the ungodly machine. Yes. Another thing with this show, unlike most reality shows, especially most reality shows that center around elimination, these only run 23 minutes. These are quick. Yes. Most reality shows with eliminations are an hour. Yes. Uh, But like running 23 minutes... If this was on TV with commercials, this would be a half-hour show. Like, a nice, good TV te- And I find it show. fascinating that they still did 23 minutes on average for an episode. Yeah. Like, it could eventually run on a television show, unedited. It could. It could. Um, they run between, like, 23 and 26 minutes or so. Yeah. I a would, couple of them are a little longer, especially in later seasons. Uh, I would say the one thing that, from a normal reality show, that is missing in this show, is downtime conversation. Yes. Because basically any of these elimination shows, like your Survivors or your Big Brothers or anything like that, there's kind of three areas. There's uh, challenge. Yes. There's elimination. And then there's strategizing, infighting, and that stuff. There's no time for that in this show because they're always in the house dealing with it. And it's inevitable. It's the best part of Daisy of Love. Is the infighting, yes. strategizing, them just messing around and like peeing in people's shoes. And I think it is a little detrimental to the show. Really? Uh, that we don't have... I think each episode could be a couple minutes. I don't think it needs to run an hour. I, I, I really like how this show is paced. I think two or three more minutes because these first few deaths don't feel consequential. And it's because I'm not a huge YouTube watcher. Of the people who were featured in this season. In later seasons, we start hitting more people I know. Right. I don't know a lot of the season one people. So I don't already have an existing relationship with them. Yeah, I think that's part of like what they're going for with the show. Is the assumption you know and care about these people already. Yeah, so some of them just feel like chum. Yeah, so it takes a while for us as people who are not familiar with these characters. To like, kind of care about them. And be upset that they're gone. Yeah. So, uh, the way they do eliminations on the show, because this is the first elimination, is there is a vote. Um, You each put in a tarot card that symbolizes another player. Is it tarot cards in the first season, or do they just write on it? They just write it on it. In the second season, it's a tarot card, you're right. Yeah, it's a little clearer. In the second season, they have more money to print nice tarot cards for every character. Because I want to talk about this specifically. Okay. The way it is phrased is, two must be chosen by vote. Yeah. All write down names and two will be chosen. That wording is very confusing because it is not true. Yes. (laughs) What it makes it sound like is, two will be, the two with the most votes will be put into the challenge. What you're actually doing is taking someone's name and putting it into a hat, and then two will be randomly chosen. So if you have an alliance, yes, and you're like, all right, all five of us are going to vote for Joey, the chances of Joey going in are high, but not guaranteed. Now, do you happen to know whether the votes were fair? I do. Is this something you want to tell me yet, or do you want to wait? Uh, I, I can tell you right now. All right. The, the the random draw for uh, the, who goes into the challenge was completely fair. Okay. It was not staged at all. Not gimmicked? Not, not gimmicked in any way. Okay. Because one of the questions I specifically asked was, was Joey protected in any way? Because it is, in fact, 
Joey's show. And it does seem super sketch that he is usually not in danger. And the response I got back was, Joey could have lost at any time. He was really good at convincing people not to write down his name. So that was, in fact, completely fair. I am, I'm surprised. I am desperate to buy this man a beer now. <laughs> like, Adam Lawson, I will buy you a beer. Let's talk. And because I, I want to bring up a, another reality show that we might actually cover because it ran one season. There was a reality show that ran on uh, Fox Kids. Okay. Hosted by my man, J.D. Roth. And it was called Moola Beach. Oh, I remember this. Yes. And the way Moola Beach worked was at elimination, there would be a challenge. And you were in uh, co-ed teams and you would compete in the challenge. If you got uh, first place, you received 10 idols. If you came in second place, you only got five. Third got four. Uh, Fourth got three, all the way down to just one. They would then take all of the idols and basically put them in this big Plinko machine. And if your color came out, you were safe. Okay. So it all came down to random draw. Now, granted, if you came in first place, you had double the amount of uh, idols than all the other teams. So it was more likely that your team was going to stay. But just because you came in last doesn't mean you were eliminated. Yeah. And I always felt like as a mechanic that was interesting, but unfair. (laughs) Okay, Hufflepuff. I'm just saying, like, we there is an episode where the team that comes in last, their idol comes out first. They're the first safe team. And they're like, woo! And it's just so it's like, oh, you know, you are the worst. But dumb luck has helped you. That is, like, kind of a bummer. This is kind of the opposite of that. This is fair to the point of possibly being detrimental to the show. Yeah. and But it's also, if you're drawn, you're in the challenge. So it's not like your name came up, you're dead. Until later. So let's talk about this first challenge. So it's this ungodly machine. The people who go up are Lele and Andrea. Mm -hmm. And they are each allowed to choose a partner. Lele chooses Eva, who is the journalist, and is rapidly approaching that, like, intrepid, brilliant final girl. Yes. Personality. Andrea chooses Justine, whose immediate response is, Don't pick me! I'm stupid! Dumb! Don't pick me! They... Please find that quote and just put in, Don't pick me! I'm stupid! Oh, Justine. What? No, I'm an idiot! You don't want me! I will. Uh, So the challenge is the people whose names are drawn are locked in a machine, which means they have no agency in whether or not they live. It is entirely up to their partner. Yes. Their partner then has to solve four puzzles to activate the machine. Is it three? It's three puzzles. Three puzzles to activate. I thought there were four lights that had to be turned on. It's uh, the first puzzle, the blueprint, and the four levers. Okay. The second puzzle is the uh, ice water, and the third puzzle is rewiring the control panel. Okay. Do you know how to do those things after watching this episode? I know the second one is difficult because it's uncomfortable. Like, the second one's actually really straightforward. Yeah. It's just uncomfortable, and that's why Justine kind of, like, has a hard time with it. Yes. Um, But, like, the rewiring? Like... You could show both of them working side by side, and we'd have no idea who was ahead, who was doing it right, what right looks like. It's not very well communicated to us as the audience what needs to happen here. And But we don't have to really think about that, because Eva smokes Justine. Yes. Like, we don't see them working side by side, because Eva absolutely just takes crap on Justine. Yes. Um. So, Eva... Uh, Gets the machine to malfunction. Lele pops out. They're like, yay, I love you. And then Andrea just, uh, her capsule fills with gray smoke. Yes, the smoke monster from Lost fills up her. Hexus from Ferngully gets her. Yes, and she is dead. Dead. Any more obscure references we want to throw in there? 
Yeah, so she... The nothing from the never-ending story (laughs) takes her. Uh, So she dies, and then an artifact pops out of the machine. Yes. Setting up this, like, when someone dies, you win something. And then Justine does nothing for herself. Yes. Justine kind of argues that, like, Andrea was useless. Well, before we, we jump into that, I believe this is where they get the note. Okay. This is where they get the note that one of them is in line with the evil. It's when Lele puts the artifact on the shelf. Yes. Like, the act of putting it on the shelf uh, rigs whatever pops out with the note. Yeah. And the artifact goes up on the mantelpiece, and I look over, and in the corner of my eye, I can I can see a bit of, bit of paper. What? what? What are you doing? What? <gasps> what does it oh, say? No. You've been warned. One among you in league with the evil of the house. Oh, Someone's nice. working with the evil? Guys, oh. who is it? It's not me, because I almost died. It's- so now... They believe that there's a saboteur among them. And they think it's I, Justine, because she didn't really try in the challenge. She really didn't. And then in one of my favorite uh, (laughs) moments, I, Justine yells, I told her not to pick me because I'm stupid. And then, oh, I don't think it's Tim. Uh, Who's like the scientist? Matt. Matt responds with something like, no one's arguing that you're not stupid. <laughs> We're saying you didn't try. All I'm saying is Justine took out Andrea. You're the, yeah. you're she the sabotaged the entire death machine. I believe that. It's oh. gotta be Justine. I told her not to pick me because I'm stupid. That doesn't change the fact you're that you killed her. Stupid. So a lot of people also become suspicious of Joey because it's his house. Yeah, I, I think if I was playing and I was in this situation, I would assume it was Joey because it's his house. And... If I was playing the character, I think my thought would be, there is a saboteur. It might be Joey. And if it's not Joey, this is still his fault. Because he still invited us here. Let's just kill Joey. <laughs> and no We should all just stab Caesar! And, like, as I'm watching it, I'm waiting for someone to get to that conclusion. Because they say a lot, like, it's his house, and Joey's like, yeah, but I wouldn't do this to you. And then that's usually enough for them to be like, you're right. Okay. And I'm like, no, kill Joey. (laughs) This is his fault. So, uh, the next one is the episode with uh, the character who has been buried. Yes. And in the early cinematic, we see a blonde woman be buried alive in order to resurrect an evil in the house. Yes. Uh, her name is Caroline. It's important we have to talk about Caroline a bunch. Yeah. So uh, that's the cinematic that sets up. Obviously, it's, and the episode is called Buried Alive. I wonder who's gonna, how this is going to play out. Yeah. Um, is it the Pokemon Buried Alive? Is that who's going to show up? No, it- no, it's not. Is it the Ryan Reynolds movie? No, it is. that's just called Buried. Is it the Ryan Reynolds movie mixed with the one about the uh, soccer team that crashes in the Andes and eats each other? Buried Alive. That was, uh, I hope you're, you're feeling very limber after the big stretch you made to make that joke. <laughs> All right. So um, the note that comes with the artifact they found in the last episode says they have to perform a seance, but they have to find a bunch of things for the seance. They have to find a piece of Caroline's clothing, her birthstone, and a lock of her hair. Uh, because they really want just Caroline. They don't want, like, rando ghosts. And yeah, with this make house, sure they get the right one. And with this house, rando ghosts, valid concern. In- entirely possible. And I believe this is where my favorite shot happens, where they're discussing who could be in line with the evil. And someone's like, I don't... The, like, you see this tight group of people talking... And one of them just goes, I don't know, I think it might be the maid. And then it zooms out and the maid is standing right next to them, just kind of looking like a guilty dog. She Uh, just like, I want to just take this moment to applaud the amazing camera work there. Yes. Because it should be pointed out that this is, as they point out a lot in season two, unrehearsed. Unscripted. Unrehearsed. 
So, like, catching those moments when it's during gameplay, because I'm sure there was, like, reshoots for, like, story elements. Yeah. But when it's, like, during gameplay, those, like, live moments, they're very well shot. The cat, the, the crew, and, like, the designers of this show earn their money. Because, like, this entire time, they're running around this mansion being unpredictable, like, making silly jokes. I don't think through this entire show we ever spot a cameraman. No, we never do. Impressive. And also, uh, they filmed two episodes a day. Right. Two episodes a night. Um, And between episodes, they had to flip the house. Yes, they had to reset everything for the next set of insane clues. And there's an episode in season two where they're clearly flipping the house in real time. Uh, the gingerbread episode when they have to follow trails of candy. They're clearly resetting those trails in real time. Yeah, so that they have... So they're, like, the production behind this is insane. Yes. So they have to perform the seance. Um, uh, so they find all these things, and the groups are Joey, Justine, and Ollie, Tim, Lele, and Glozelle, and Matt, Sierra, and Eva. And they run around, they find everything... And uh, they get a picture on how to do a seance. Yes. And they're like, well, who's going to get possessed? And Sarah's like, ooh, me. I think we also need to talk about the massive amount of sale of failing they do in like trying to follow a diagram. Oh, my God. Because there's a lot of like, they're trying to like draw with salt. And they're like, shouldn't that line be behind... All right, and they're like moving handfuls of salt. This is fun. It is. And this is a trend, not with just this cast, but both seasons we've seen so far. Anytime they have to follow a diagram, they're going to have a bad time. Yes. So Sarah agrees to be the conduit for Caroline's uh, spirit. Yes. Almost like they had to pick somebody who would know what line she needed to say. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And they find out that to hide the artifact, Caroline had been buried alive. So to recover the artifact, they would have to bury someone alive. So they get the key and they find the coffin. Well, well, at the time, they're lied to and they're like, all you gotta do is dig it up and it's fine. Yes. Just dig it up. It's cool. And then when they dig it up, they're like, so I lied to you. Someone will have to be buried alive. That's right. The note about having to bury someone alive is in the coffin. Yes. So when they open the coffin, they expect to find the artifact. Because they don't know how the show works yet. Right. Because this is only the second elimination. And for this one, there's no challenge. It's just, hey, we're going to vote. And again, it's not really a vote. (laughs) It's a random draw based on who you vote for. However... Everyone's still pretty mad at Justine. Yes. So she is probably close to unanimously thrown in the bin. And she is the one who gets voted to be buried alive. And she dies horribly, screaming. Well, what's especially great about this is they have to do the burying. Yeah. So, like, she's screaming. They're like, we got to do it. Just throw more dirt on it. And the only person who's kind of against this... Besides I, Justine, who is not stoked, uh, is Joey. Yeah. Joey is screaming like, this is sick. I hate this. <laughs> so if you're worried that they're both in league with the house, like, if they're both in league with the house, they are each other's only ally at this yes. point. And there's one great moment where they're all burying I, Justine, and she's screaming and banging against the coffin. And they're like, Joey, we all have to do it. He's like, no, I won't bury my friends. Like, we all have to do it. And he just kind of grabs a handful of dirt and just goes, eh, there, I helped. Yeah, this is the first, and because we didn't really have enough time to know Andrea, this is the first death that feels like the logical conclusion to a storyline. Mm-hmm. Like, well, we don't know if the saboteur was Justine... But now she's dead. Yeah. Because, like, she's screaming, she's screaming, she's screaming. And then it goes silent. And then they get the artifact. And then they're like, all right, time to go. 
I was like, hmm. You have the artifact. Why don't you just, why don't you just dig her back up? It, it takes longer than that to die of asphyxiation. Yeah, she, she probably just got tired. <laughs> you probably... No? Just going to leave her in the ground? Okay. <laughs> yep. I know it's the show, but... Like, this is one of the only ones that feels like they could have cheated it. Yeah, and... Most of them don't feel like you could have cheated it in any way. Th- this is not something I asked my new best friend about. But uh, I am curious to know more about this particular moment. Because it's suspicious that there's no challenge. It's just like, yeah, you got to vote and that's the end of it. I mean, there are... I just realized something about season two that's reflective of this. That's interesting. But there are a couple throughout the show at large where there really isn't a vote. Or, or there really isn't a challenge. It's just like... It feels arbitrary, and I think it's to keep you on your toes. Yes. It's to keep you from assuming uh, that you could still win if your name is, comes up. Yeah. Now, I, I will say at this point, I'm enjoying the show. Yes. I'm enjoying what I'm watching, but I'm very turned off by the gameplay. Because I immediately go, oh, well, now I don't want to be on this show. Because, like... It feels arbitrary. It feel, yeah. It feels very total, total drama island <laughs> on how you get eliminated. So I was like, ah, uh, all right. So, like, fun show. I'm entertained. Game theory-wise, not super feeling it. Yeah. I hold the right to change my opinion as we go through more episodes. So, the fourth episode starts with an effectively creepy cinematic of a serial killer who has sat this family down to family dinner. And he is clearly going to kill this family and make them into mannequins. That's like his thing. Mm -hmm. So that's the animatic we get at the beginning. So it sets up this like creepy doll mannequin. This season loves creepy dolls. Yes. This kind of, this entire like... Season kind of reminds me of like season one of American Horror Story. Yes, where we there are a few monsters that we're going to get into later, but most of the stories that we learn about about this house come from this place of person who was just so evil that it took a supernatural form. Yes, like their evil acts were just so vile. That the energy from them have created something terrible. Yes. And that's what we get in this doll episode. Yes. Or not dolls. We'll get to dolls later. Mannequins. Mannequin episode. So Justine, uh, Justine's dead and Joey is still distraught. Glozell kind of thinks that he's faking it. Like, yes. That he's really hamming it up. We buried Justine, but you were acting like you were just so sad. And I just don't believe that you were really so sad. Why? I'm about to act Oh, Joey. You didn't buy no, my not at act? All. Oh, dude, this is my she friend. She was my friend. I don't believe that. I don't believe it at all. You know, my intuition now is telling me that Joey has got to be in on this. Yeah, at this point, Lozelle is my favorite character because she wants to kill Joey. This is his house and it is his fault and we should murder him. Yes, that's entirely her. Uh, no, that was Noah talking. Glozell just agrees. <laughs> Fair, okay. Um, so they find this box they find with the artifact, and they break the rule of escape the rooms, and they break it. Yeah. Because I, I laugh because there's definitely a moment where they're trying to figure out if they're allowed to break it. Yes. And then eventually they smash it, and they find the next clue. But they definitely have that moment of like, are we allowed to break Th- it? This is where they're smashing globes? Um, no, this is the box they got with the artifact. Okay, because later on they just break things arbitrarily, which is great. (laughs) Yeah, that's after this, once they learn they're allowed. Yes. And they get something that says idle. So they find these clocks, or this clock that has four hands. Yes. And they spell out idle with the hands of the clock. And... They're, they find this, like, okay, there's a keyhole in the bookshelf and a photo of the staircase. Tim sees a car outside. And he gets Sierra alone. And we don't know a lot about Sierra. 
Mm-hmm. Tim has been like making his name among the cast of like he is in love with every lady. Yes. He is a douchebag. <laughs> yeah, he's really leaning into like and he says it's like he's I'm a mobster. I'm a mobster. He's the one that's like playing the character most. Yeah, he's having fun being Scarface. Yes. This this is where I kind of come up with this idea of the reason that they have personas is to give them the opportunity to be reality show villains without it reflecting poorly on their channel. Yeah, because Sierra is the heiress. And it's really easy that she could be a giant brat. Yeah. Like, everyone's kind of something that could be arguably evil. Yeah. Um. So Tim's like, come look at this car with me, Sierra. And she's like, okay. Uh, but then in her confessional, she's like, it was weird and it was creepy, but mm-hmm. I went with him anyway. Because once again, they don't know how the game is played. Right. Like, there could be a mechanic where players can kill other players. Yes. Um. So they find, the rest of the group finds the room full of mannequins. And then they're like, where, where are Tim and Sierra? And they kind of do this really good car puzzle. Where they go into the glove box, because that's the first place you would go in a car. Yes. Never gloves in there. And there's, like, a note that says, like, slow down. So they find a key by the brake pedal. And it's in the trunk. And there's a mannequin in the trunk. The missing mannequin from the family dinner. Yes. Uh, The eldest sister, I believe. Now, and I believe at the same time, and this is just a little thing I noticed. At the same time, Joey and the rest of the group are trying to solve puzzles of this family. Yes, they're trying to figure out... It's another diagram. Yes. They're trying to arrange the mannequins at the dinner table. And they're missing one. And they're missing one. And, like, as they're missing one, there's a clue about a car. Yes. So it kind of implies that the way this was supposed to go is they were supposed to find this room first, solve everything in that room, get the clue about the car, and then discover the car. This is the first time it seems like, oh, things naturally went out of order. The sequence broke this. And it still works. And it makes the show interesting. Yeah. And you kind of wonder, like, why was Tim trying to get Sierra outside? So the elimination challenge is that two people must go play perverse games on the second floor with the artifact. And they vote in Joey and Lele. Yes. Lele pretty much volunteers. Like, Lele's like, Lele's like, please, perverse games. I would like to do this very much, please. Despite the fact she's already been in a death challenge. It is episode four, and this is her second death challenge. Yeah, and this is something I want to bring up. In my game theory brain, the, the way that they try to, like, vote people in is, like, who's useless? Like, who who can we afford to lose? And all this stuff. I think what I would have said... From the beginning is, everyone's got to do it once. Like, everyone's got to do a challenge. If you think a challenge is good for you, you volunteer. Yeah. But everybody's got to play the game once. Yeah, and they they don't... They do that a little more in season two. Where the decision seemed to be made of, you didn't do it yet, so it should be you. Mm -hmm. That's That's just my little how I would play this game. So Joey and Lele go upstairs, and to me, I'm like, okay, Lele might figure if she lives, she can get out of the next, like, couple. Yeah, I think it also is dangerous, though, because I had the thought, if she lives, she's evil. Yeah. she survived two now. Right, and she's going to survive against Joey. Yeah. So if she somehow is involved in getting rid of Joey... Yeah, and at this point, I kind of think... Joey has plot armor. So I'm bummed out because I'm like, oh, I really like Lele. Yeah, because Lele has been pretty fun at this point. Yeah, her character tends to be, I'm over this. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, whatever, there's murders, (laughs) which I I love Lele. But also this, like, there's murders. Uh, Something's got to get done. All right, well, I'll do it, whatever. And they have to do this spin the bottle game with mannequins. Yes. So they have to, like, make out with mannequins. Yeah. And Lele's like, all right. 
Yeah. And Joey's like, I'm uncomfortable. And Layla's like, get over it. Get over it and go hump that mannequin. And then Joey humps a mannequin. Yeah, Joey has to do stuff. This is very funny if you've seen season two. Yes, it is. And that is all we will say at this time. Um, because this is a very, uh, this is very prescient of how season yes. two looks. But they get all the codes they need and a book comes out. And somebody was watching Death Note. Yes. And Ryuk is there eating apples. No, he's not. But uh, basically, they can write down, or they must write down, one person's name in the book. And that person will die. Yep. No questions asked. That's done. Death. And, uh... Layla wants Mac. She's already annoyed with Mac. Yeah, She's Matt, a know-it-all. And Mac's also been, like, accusatory towards Layla of being evil. Yes. And Joey, of course, wants Glazelle. Because right. Glazelle has been accusatory to Joey because she is correct. And they briefly argue, and then Joey promises Lele that he will back her up to Matt yeah. and be like, no, Lele is cool. They argue for a little longer, and then Lele literally goes, oh, it's your house. No, I, Joey just goes, I'm doing it. She does say, oh, well, it's your house, I guess. But, but I think that's after he starts writing. Yeah, so... Could, the, which, to me, is an interesting mechanic of, like, whoever's name, the ring it's written in here, and there's no vote. It's just like, I will steal that pen from you, and I will write your name if I want. Yeah. Like, that is a very interesting way to do this. Yeah, and this there's clearly some, like, trickery in how this is done and shot. Yes. So, Joey writes Glozell, and then downstairs in the holding pen parlor... Mm-hmm. And in both seasons we've watched so far, there's been, like, the holding pen room. Yes. Where they just kind of hang out during challenges. Yes. I call it the, the room to start arguments because they have that room in another reality show we like. Ink, Ink Master. Master. Where it's like, clearly there's a room where you all sit down and the producer comes in and says, all right, now yell at each other. <laughs> so they're just kind of sitting around yelling at each other and then Glazelle... Just dies. <laughs> yeah. She um, she violently seizes, coughs up blood again. That's mm-hmm. something they love doing on this. They're like squibs. Um, and she convulses in a way that causes Tim to scream, she's twerk dying. She's twerk dying. She twerk dies and I am bummed out. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, Matt starts screaming at Joey and Lele when they come downstairs. Uh, th- this is very important. Joey's like, let's not say what happened. Yeah. And then Lele says exactly what happened. Yes. Uh, Joey's like, this is the one of the few times you could withhold information. Because mm-hmm. we talked about this when we watched one of the season two episodes, that we would have just lied. Yeah, what I would have said was, the challenge was there was all these mannequins. Each one represented one of us. And we had to save as many as we could. And we almost saved all of them. But as much as we tried, one got away and it was Glazelle. And I feel real bad. And you should all feel real bad for me. (laughs) Yeah, like, or even the idea that, like, we didn't know what the cause and effect was going to be. We did X, Y, and Z. And we didn't know what the A, B, and C that would be caused by that would be. Yeah. Uh, And then they hear Roaring. Yes. The guardian of the house has been released. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. He's a big dude. Yeah. <laughs> he a big boy. And his name is Sam. Sam. Sam the guardian. Hey, it's me. It's Sam. Sam. I'm a giant. Sam the big guardian. Do you know my friend Donald the vampire? No! That's a callback to all the true Stay Doomed fans. Oh my god, that's a callback to like, what, episode three? Oh my god. Yeah, that's, that was a joke from Mad Madhouse. Yeah, that was a long time ago. <laughs> so, uh, this one is this one starts off with like a ringmaster and a circus. Yes. And this is the one with the oranges that you were talking about. Yeah, so this drove me insane. There is a puzzle where uh, they get a clue and it's something, something about oranges. 
Yeah. And then Joey's like, do you smell oranges? And then they follow their nose to try to find where the orange scent is coming from so they can find their next clue. I can't find something in my brain that would be less visibly interesting than a smell clue. Yeah, it's very hard to... So, like, from an audience point of view, there is a moment of, like, what even is this? Because we can't, like, visually see, oh, you're smelling wrong. It's just, like, a weird speed bump that they're dealing with, and we take their word for. Yeah, so... Yeah, the follow your nose clue is kind of a difficult one to get through. And they find the ticket box... They put in the ticket that Joey has, and they find two clown masks. And the clown mask makes you invisible to the Guardian. Yes. Because it makes you kind of visually blend in with what he's used to. Yeah, so what the game is, is they have to solve some sort of puzzle, but the Guardian wants to capture you. But if you're wearing the clown mask, uh, the Guardian can't see you. But you can only wear the mask for... Limited amount of time. Yes. I forget exactly what the time frame is. Yeah. So they're all kind of in this safe zone. And there's a spot where you can do like mask transfers. Yes. And they're trying to solve this puzzle under a time limit. And this is where they introduce this mechanic where if you're captured, you kind of like Thanos snap away. Yeah. Which is very confusing. Because we, this is a show where death is elimination. Yeah, so... And it says things, it says Tim is eliminated. Yes. So at the time we're like, are they dead? Is that the end of their their time here? Uh, And this is where we first have our first discussion. And this is a discussion we have many times throughout this show about shoes. Yes. Uh, because the uh, this is challenge is based on running and stealth. Mm-hmm. The girls are at a natural disadvantage because their costumes are 1920s period close. Yeah. But they're in character shoes, heels. They look like they're mostly in character shoes. Yeah. Nobody's in high tops. Yeah. Like no one's, you know, th- you could twist an ankle. Is yeah, what and I'm even saying. the guys are in dress shoes. Yeah. But the girls are naturally going to be a little bit, uh, a little bit slower, or a little bit in more danger. So they're going to have to be a little more careful. Yeah, which I thought was a bit of a bummer, and it feels a bit unfair. And with this challenge, it begs the question: like that, they succeed, and that what the in succeeding, they summon the ringmaster to like retrieve his monster. Yeah, who's a cool character. Who's a fantastic character. But does this mean that had they have lost, that there was some other outcome? Well, I no, can I did tell some you, research. I can tell you, yes. But he didn't tell me what would have happened. So there was a fail state. There was some sort of fail state, which is the big question I had constantly with the quest. Yes. Was like, yeah, like what would have happened if they failed? Like, was there a branching path or was this on rails? And it's good to know that this show was not on rails. It's really hard to show that. Yeah. Without like tipping your hand things, but it's good to know that like they had a plan on what they were going to do had they lost this challenge. Because, I mean, what happens here feels like a saving throw. Um, Tim and Ollie get voted into the challenge, and it's a three-part challenge. They're all usually multiple parts. Yes. The first one is the, like, the strength challenge, which is the classic carnival game where you, you know, swing a hammer onto the bell. Mm-hmm. Ollie wrecks Tim. Yes. Um, the next is juggling. Yes. And it doesn't go well. Yes. For I, anybody. I think for uh, our plus two comedy, uh, Stay Doomed Extra... I'm going to try to juggle. And you guys tell me if I deserve to live more than Tim and Ollie. Okay. And then they have to walk a tightrope. Yes. Which is kind of cool. Yeah. That's, that's something I've always wanted to try. I've tried a slack line, but I've never tried a tightrope. And Tim wins this one. No. Oh, he does. He wins the, the tightrope. Yes. He wins the tightrope. 
Ollie wins the strongman. Yeah, so they, and they each win both one. suck at juggling. So then the audience, th- there's an audience of like ghosts in the circus. And each of Tim and Ollie have been placed in a dunk tank. Yeah. And uh, it's full of piranhas. Yes. So if you get dunked, you're going to get eaten by fishies. Yeah. You die. We'll buy fishies. And so they, they ask the audience, and also in the audience is... The rest of the contestants. The rest of the contestants. So they're also cheering and, like, affecting the applause meter of sorts. Yeah, and they're championing Ollie over Tim. Yeah. Uh, Tim has irritated too many of the women. Yeah, because he is kind of a douchebag. And I want to say, Tim walks the douchebag line very well. Yeah. Because, like, it's one of those guys where he's clearly a douche, but you still invite him to the party. Yeah. (laughs) Like, he's still fun enough to keep around. And then, like, when new people come over, you're like, Tim's a douchebag, but you'll learn to love him. (laughs) So, the ringmaster decides to kill them both. Yes. So, they both get dunked. And you're just like, oh my god, they just killed everybody. Yeah, it's dumb old elimination week. And then they're both just kind of in the dunk tank. And they put their heads out. And the ringmaster's like, oops, forgot to put the piranhas. You saved my guardian. You can go. Yes. So, I assume someone would have died had they had lost that challenge. Yes. That's an assumption. I haven't asked my new best friend Adam about this, but that that is the feeling that they put out in the show. Like, like, whether or not that is true is debatable, but it's definitely the feeling they want you to have in watching this episode. Yeah, and then they did run halfway through the season. They run a recap. Yes. And I think that might be where we stop for this one. I think this might be the coveted two-parter. Are are we five episodes deep? Yes. All right. So, yeah, we are halfway through, and we are well over an hour. And we're also recording this later in the week, so I don't have as much time to edit. So I think this might be where we have to call. Yeah, and I want to talk a lot about season two. And I want to give... The the problem when we do reality shows is we talk a lot in the first half about setting up the gameplay, setting up characters, and then... We want to talk more about the second half because that's when actually like all the interesting things happen. And yeah. the second half doesn't always get a fair shake. Yes. So I, I will say at this point, I think this show is okay. I think the gameplay is super flawed and unfair. Mm-hmm. Like to the point that if I was on this show, I might start some shit <laughs> over what's happening. Like, I'm not opposite worlds, I'm going to threaten to murder someone level. Yeah. If you haven't listened to our opposite wor- worlds episode, I the rules are so broken in that show, I would start murdering the other team. Yeah. Because <laughs> they established that you could just do that. Yeah, no, opposite worlds is probably the only game we've played where... Everything was broken. Everything about it is broken. Because I had problems with the whodunit gameplay, um, which we might touch on a little more next yes. week. Um, and this at least, a lot of it feels very arbitrary. Yes. But I, I feel, I'm still having fun at this point. Uh, it's definitely fun, but like, there are issues. And... That That's as far as that we've gotten. That's all that we will say. I will say that, like, my opinion is going to change in a little bit. Yes. <laughs> so, I, I know... Adam said he would listen to this, and I feel like all I did was rip apart his show. <laughs> no, I had a good time. <laughs> but uh, my opinions change drastically later on. Uh, but these five episodes set up... Basically, the main thing that they set up is any anything goes. Is... You usually need a death for an artifact. Usually. Yeah. Unless you don't. Yeah, I mean, almost everything is. Here are the rules. Unless, unless they're not. not. Because it's like, uh, you have to go through a challenge. Unless you don't. Unless you don't. And this, unless you just vote for I, Justine. Uh, the two people go into the challenge, one will come back alive. Unless they kill someone else. Yeah. Uh, or neither of them die. So the show's fun. Has flaws, 
super unpredictable, uh, and they didn't. They're not on my team to kill Joey, which I'm a little salty. Yeah. Now I would definitely call the show very campy. Yes. At this point, but I'm having a lot of fun because uh, you know we we talked about before we this episode's on delay because we've had some things going on. Yes. This has been a really fun show to watch when you need something escapist. Yeah. Um, we're using Escape the Night to escape our problems. <laughs> yes. And I, I will end by saying this. Uh, where do they go to sign up for the update about season five? Air quote season five. So if you go to Twitter and go to at Escape the Night, Escape the Night, the uh, pinned tweet is the call to action to sign up for this Discord. The official announcement is going to be today. The day this show drops. Really? Yes. Because I, since I got to talk to Adam Lawson, I immediately was like, I'm really enjoying the show. Is there anything that you can tell us about season five? And he responded on this, I must remain silent. And then my phone got really hot. So, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Uh, so, I'm on the Discord. My username is at Stay Doomed. Yes, I'm at TV's Noah. By the time that this goes up, uh, I should be involved in that Discord as well. And their Twitter account is dropping character intros of the different character archetypes from season one. Right. Now, they are very obviously not the exact likenesses of the YouTubers. For instance, the gambler has red hair instead of... Uh, I Justine's blonde hair. So they're clearly not meant to be I Justine as the gambler. It's clearly meant to be the gambler as yes. her own entity. Yes. So it's the mystery should be revealed very, very soon. And uh, I am so down. Yes, this so, looks like a lot of fun. So, so down that we're going to do another episode about the rest of season one of Escape the Night, where we'll cover the rest of the show, a little bit of season two. And probably by that point, a little bit of season three. A little bit of season three, and of course, give it a verdict. Yes. So, I would say, what do we want to next week? Escape it's, the Night. It's more somewhere. Escape the, the Night. Where can people find us, Laura? You can email us at the Stay Doomed Show at gmail.com or on Facebook and Twitter at Stay Doomed. Uh, and if you want to talk to me about how they should kill Joey, I'm at plus two comedy on Twitter and I'm at TV's Noah on Discord. And uh, if you're looking to discuss gameplay or if you happen to find me on the Discord, I'm at stay doomed. Until next time, stay doomed. <laughs>